Hello everyone, welcome again once again to the Truth and Guidance Show. I thank everyone for joining us once again and we thank God for everyone being here. I pray everyone that had a has had a blessed weekend on this um Tuesday, very cold Tuesday and Wednesday, or oh, very windy Tuesday. I don't know where you all are, uh, some of you that are listening, but here is very windy and it's very cold. As we said before, we're having some up and down weather, but either way, I thank God for being here. And one of the greatest things about doing this um, platform and this broadcast, the way we're doing it, we get to do it, you know, in the comfort of the indoors, outside of the, away from the elements, we don't have to travel. And especially you all that are listening get to do it from the comforts of your own home or wherever you may be listening to, whether it be your car or at work or wherever you may be. I think most of people at this time of night are listening at home, and I appreciate you all for joining in and tuning in with us and um, share, just sharing this broadcast with us. I thank God for the last broadcast we have. God is really blessed and um, just really opened up our hearts and minds and understanding the word. We were, get, we were able to relay the word and revelate the scriptures. Um, you know, as we always say, rightly divide the word of truth. I thank God for that. I thank God for just keeping us and, you know, keeping us covered on this precious blood. You know, keeping us day by day. And thank God because some did not make it on this morning. Some did not make it through the weekend. We have, you know, a lot of people closed their eyes and did not wake up this morning. You look at the news, you see accidents left and right. You know, um, people are just dying day by day. More we see now more than we have ever seen in our lifetime. People are leaving here. And like I've always stated, you know, my thing is, is just you just need to make sure that your name is most definitely written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You need to make sure that you are most definitely written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's the most important thing because if your name is written, that means when he comes back, you will be going back with him. So like I said, there's a lot of people leaving here, you know, and, and I, I pray that they have gotten it together. If not, you know, we know the scriptures, you know, those that die without him, you know, where they wind up, you know, we, I'm not one of those preachers or teachers that preach everybody into the heavens because we know according to scripture, everybody ain't going. Uh, a preacher said one time, everybody may be gone, but everybody's not staying. So I want to be the one of the ones that go and stay. Again, I thank God for being here. This is allowing to come before you once again. And we're still in the book of Acts. Um, we've been studying today and um, this time, you know, the Lord allowed me to be able to write notes and to do my notes. And um, I, I, I believe tonight I'm going to be able to go by my notes because of what he has shown me and uh, helped me to understand. And so uh, I don't know how far we get, but a lot of the majority of the notes that we have and the things that we want to show you tonight is in the one is in one chapter. That's the 15th chapter. And uh, of course, like I always say, I like the book of it. I love the book of Acts. And um I got some few favorite chapters in there, and the 15th is one of them. And as we get into the Word and we begin to um, just open up the Word of God in that 15th chapter, you will see why. If you are watching and listening by way of computer, we have we posted the uh, all our reference scriptures. This time we posted it on our um, website. And uh, if you are listening and you want to go to the website to be able to follow, just look and be able to follow the scriptures, you know, it's blog talk radio dot com forward slash truth and guidance ministries that is blog talk radio dot com forward slash truth and guidance ministries um like i said so we have the uh, scriptures post of course i will be announcing them as we go on um the uh, different reference scriptures that we'll be using because we have a few of them because we definitely want to um highlight several points in this 15th chapter because it, it's, it, it marks a specific time in the book of Acts and the life of the apostles, as far as the life of the church, the beginning of the church, different councils, different things that were ordained in the church and um, instituted. And so we're definitely going to get into that. But before we go into that, <clears throat> we're going to um, go to the throne of grace. Dear Heavenly Father, by your name, Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for watching over and keeping us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for a day we have not seen before, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for this brand new day, brand new mercies that you have stowed upon us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we should just anoint us, Lord. Just anoint the word, Lord Jesus, that you have prepared on tonight, Lord Jesus. Give us the ability to um, understand, Lord, and rightly divide the word of truth on tonight. 
Lord, bless you to grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, Lord Jesus. Bless the hearer of this word, whether they be listening now or later to the rebroadcast of this message on tonight, Lord Jesus. We ask you to just open up their hearts and minds that they may hear and understand the word of God, Lord Jesus. Where we may not be just hearers only, but doers of the word, Lord Jesus. That we may understand that that you have for us in this last and evil days, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask you to go out and bless the sick and afflicted, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask you to comfort the bereaved right now by the mighty name of Jesus. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So those of you that are following, you know, um, we're still, like I said, we're in the book of Acts. And tonight we're starting off on Acts, the um, 15th chapter of the book of Acts. And I am going to do my best with the, the, not to go too fast. That way you can understand me <clears throat> and be able to follow along. But like I said, we have uh, um, several points that we want to bring out. And I'm going to be not only reading in the chat, but I'm going to be reading um, the comments that um, I wrote down earlier. And also what the Lord has already will give as we read these scriptures. And what I'm going to do tonight, um, just a slightly different way I normally do it. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole entire 15th chapter. I want to go ahead and read that, and then we're going to refer to the comments and the notes because, like again, I'm a, I want to show you how this marks, you know, as far as even the beginning of the church when the Gentiles got saved and they came in, you know, there was different um, uh, disputes that were going on, you know, um, from the different sect of the Jews uh, from Judea concerning the Gentiles and different laws and ordinances that they wanted to institute in the church, and this was this 15th chapter about, and this also marks. This is the first council that is recorded, you know, that they had, you know, we the most famous one that we know of and we talk about all the time is called the Council of Nisi or some people say the Nisian Council. But this right here, one we're dealing with tonight, this goes, this was the first one. This is the first council of the apostles of the church heads, authorities that came in. And they dealt with the issue of the church as far as what to believe, what not to believe, what to teach, what not to teach. And the Nicene Council was the second one that came in after that. The reason why that's one of the most famous of because they dealt with the main thing they dealt with was the Godhead, the triune nature. That was the main thing that they focused on that one. And each council had a uh, uh, they had a specific thing that they dealt with. This one here is dealing with um, ceremonial laws, dealing with circumcision. And um, the, the other the Nicene Council is dealing with the um, baptism, is dealing with the Godhead, dealing with the triune nature. I encourage you, if, have, if you've never read it, look it up online. It's called the Nicene Council or the Council of Nicene. Um, or either you can look, if you put in the Trinitarian controversy, you'll also be able to find it. I mean, you'll be surprised at some of the things that you'll understand and understand how the doctrine, a lot of doctrines that you preach in your churches a lot of times come about. You know, and you will see it's not direct scripture. It came from a group of men trying to understand the scriptures, trying to understand the writing of the apostles. And so in their natural mind, understanding outside of the spirit of God, they come up with different ideas and legislation of what to believe, what not to believe and what to decree and what not to decree. So that was the second one. The apostles had nothing to do with that. The men that set themselves up at that point in time to have that meeting, they dubbed themselves, as we know, they are the Catholic Church. They look at themselves as the apostles. You know, when you deal with right now, if you put in and you type up, you try to look up apostles or apostleship or apostolic, it's going to take you to the Catholic Church because they have set themselves up as the apostolic authority, you know, especially if you deal with the apostolic succession. But we know, according to the word of God and the scripture, that they are not. That's not the order. The order that they have set up. Matter of fact, and some of the things we uh, we will not read tonight, but even the Timothy talks about that. I believe it also in Titus, where he warned them about people, you know, forbidding you to marry and abstaining from meats, letting you know that those are false prophets, false teachers, you know, and to beware of them. But tonight we want to go ahead and get started <clears throat> in the 15th chapter. Like I said, I don't know how far we get tonight outside of the 15th chapter, but um, we're gonna just let the Lord have His way and. Um, and do what that says the Lord, but we're going to begin to read in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15, starting at the verse, first verse, and it reads, And a certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now, if you follow along, you know what I do. Underline that, highlight it. 
put your finger on it. Don't miss that point. That's that is a very that first verse is very important. I want I need you to underline that, mark that. Is he says that except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. So let you know the issue that's coming up is dealing with salvation, them being saved. Second verse. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small decision and dispution with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain or and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversation of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of the matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear, with, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples? I want you to underline that part there too. The part where he says to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples. That's also a important part that we're going to bring out in our um, commentary at the read. Which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitudes kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul declaring that excuse me, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. That is the church. Those that don't know, that is the church that he's talking about. And you can also reference 1 Peter 2 and 9 on that. Mark that, you know, write that on the side. Note 1 Peter 2 and 9. That's when you see that 14th verse where he says, Simmons has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. You see that in 1 Peter 2 and 9, the 15th verse. And to this, uh, and to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and I will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who, who does all things, excuse me, who does all these things. Known unto God are all his works from beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then please it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Sicily. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your soul saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment 
it seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with your with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by, by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary. I'm going to read that 20th verse again. Catch that. He says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. So, so when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation, and Judas and Silas, being prophets themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname as Mark was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with him, who departed from them, from um, Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And they continued, excuse me, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Sicilia, confirming the churches. Amen. We thank the Lord for the reading of those scriptures. Amen. I, I'm actually I'm gonna go a little bit backwards. Um, I want to comment on that thir that uh 37, 38, 39th verse. Those last few verses that we just read. We should to understand why you know Paul didn't want him to go because when they were out preaching before, and when they were had to leave. John did not stay with them. He departed. He did not continue with them. Paul wanted someone that was going to stay the course with them and that was going to last with them. It wasn't something that he did something so wrong or so bad, but it's just the type of man Paul was, the type of uh, apostle that he became. He wanted someone that was going to stick out through the whole journey, you know, from beginning to end. You know, when they left, they left together. When they stayed, they, they, they you know, uh, uh, they stayed together. And that's something John didn't do. So he rather have taken someone with him that was going to stay the course along with them. And so, like I said, it, the scripture said, you know, it was a great, thing between them, contention between them, but yet they did not let them, let it stop them from preaching and teaching the word of God. A lot of times, you know, I mean, we ought to be the same way. You, you ought to want someone, especially those that go out and preach and teaching the word of God. You want someone that's going to stay with you. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a lot of times we think because we are saved, everybody has the Holy Ghost, that everybody can work together. We should be able to work together, but sometimes people have the way they work, where they do things, and their agenda may be slightly different. And you, you know, how can two walk together except they agree? A lot of times that's not always in a sinful nature, but even among saints, sometimes you just have your differences of how you do things, you know. So when you find someone in like manner that works in like manner with you, it's best to, that's how you, you, you need to pair up that way. Because guess what? You're going to you're going to hinder the, you know, Holy Ghost. You're going to hinder the word going out because you, you're not going to agree. You're not going to walk together. You're not going to do as you should. Because what? What's the problem? You have a, a, a dissension between the two. You have a disagreement and you're going to always rub heads and bump heads, you know, about how to do things. It doesn't It doesn't take away any, from anyone's salvation. It's simply is that people, a lot of people work different. So we must understand that. But getting into um, our notes um, on this 15th chapter. 
Just follow along with me. I'm going to be reading. It says, in Acts chapter 15, the issue of certain ceremonial laws came up by some of the men in Judea. One of the main things that that of excuse me, one of the main things was that of circumcision for salvation. This is the same thing that happens to the churches today. Preachers instituting things and bylaws that God nor the apostles gave us. Now we see in that first, that's why I say it, highlight that or underline that in the first verse, that they were saying, except they follow the law of Moses concerning the circumcision that they would not be saved, that they had to be saved. So, today, even today, people go out and they look into the scriptures. They go throughout, and, and it's funny how, you know, you can go and skip through, you know, go through Romans, you know, Ephesians, different other the chapters throughout the uh, first and second Corinthians, and find little tidbits, or uh, I would say a sentence, a phrase we get we get into some of those later a little later on in the broadcast, and they take that and want to hinge a whole doctrine off of it. Now, why is this important? Because we know the gospel has already been preached. The foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ has already been preached, and the apostles have been going out and they have been spreading the gospel. They have been laying the foundation of Jesus Christ. You know, the death, preaching the death, burial, and resurrection, salvation. We even see where throughout, you know, the, the prior to the book of Acts, prior to the 15th chapter, where, excuse me, because of the preaching of the gospel, there were those that got saved, refilled with the Holy Ghost. And we see they were all baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They all received the Holy Ghost. And, you know, like we always say in the scriptures, they with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But we see salvation. Now, here you come with some sect, different ones from Judea, the Pharisees. They're now saying and coming up with a different doctrine, a different gospel, saying that in order for them to be saved, they have to go by and abide by the law of Moses by being circumcised. That would, the, none of Jesus never preached that. He never taught that to his disciples. None of his disciples, and when, you know, when they begin to preach after the day of Pentecost, not once. Do you hear them preach that in order for them to be saved, that they had to be circumcised? Circumcision was not a part of salvation at this point in time. Why was it an issue? We're going to get into and show you why it was an issue concerning circumcision, why they brought this about. Number one, they wanted to spread heresies. They wanted to spread dissimulation amongst, you know, the Gentiles that were being saved. And they wanted to hold, they wanted to hold to their own doctrine. They wanted to hold to the law of Moses. And as you see, you know, we're going to get in, we're going to break this down as far as, you know, the different sects of the verses, how, you know, what the things that um the, the apostles dealt with, you know, mainly Peter, because if you see, Peter took the chief seat. In this, you know, we call Paul the chief apostle. We call Paul, but you know, a lot of times we read in the scripture, you know, Peter basically was the chief apostle. Peter was the one that stood up. There was a reason why when Jesus said that, you know, I'll give thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The keys were the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other key to the kingdom of heaven is other than preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you come up under the death, burial, resurrection, meaning you were born again. Baptized in his name, received the Holy Ghost, that's your way in. He told Nicodemus, in order for him to see the kingdom, he had to what? Be born of the water and the spirit. Those are the keys to the kingdom. He didn't preach and teach about any other keys. I would like to point out a few scriptures that were results of this incident and also coincide the letters that Peter commanded to be written to the Gentiles. One of the first things that we're always talking about, we're already talking about, is the circumcision. Now, we're going to go, our first reference scripture, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 10. I mean, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse 10, 10 through 14. That's Genesis chapter 17, starting at verse 10 through verse 14. Give you a second, if you're following, to get that. And we're going to show you, you know, what um, when God first gave... Uh, um, Abraham, the covenant concerning circumcision, and that that lasted throughout. That was perpetual. That was eternal. You know, even to this day, they're still circumcised. They're still being circumcised. Even to this day, we know that you know now because of health reasons. 
You know, hospitals have made it a practice when a male child is born, you know, within a certain amount of days. I don't know if they actually, I can look it up, still do it by the eighth day. But according to the law, the law that God gave Abraham, the covenant, by the eighth day, they had to be circumcised. You even hear Paul talking about it, say he was circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin because he named that because he let them know who he was. He was a Jew. You know, he was just a circumcised Jew. So we're going to read Genesis chapter 17. Starting at verse 10, it says, This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he, excuse me, he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generation. He that is born in the house or bought. This is very important now. It says, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of the seed. That means anybody that comes outside of the seed of Abraham, whether considered a Gentile, considered any, any stranger, this also went to them. He that is born in the house and he that is brought with the money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, excuse me, circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my commandment. Now, excuse me, we see this. This is an everlasting covenant. Everlasting means everlasting. Perpetual forever covenant that he made with Abraham that they would be that they that that covenant will last with them you know, concerning the circumcision. Now, what is a covenant? A covenant is a will, it is a promise. This was the promise that he made, the covenant that he made, or the promise that he made with Abraham. He sealed that promise with the cutting of the foreskin. That was a sign of that promise. Of that covenant. The promise was what? That he would give them a land. His seed would be blessed. His seed seed in all the all the nations of the, of the land. All the all, all the kindreds of the land. Will be blessed. Through Abraham's seed. Now. So we see this. So he said everlasting covenant. Which means. After Abraham did this. Did this through, through his sons, and his sons did it to his sons, and it went on, and it continued, continued going on. It's now the custom, part of the covenant. It's part of the law that they do this. So here we go, speed it all the way up until this point. It never ended. It was never supposed to end. But God came in through Jesus Christ with a much more better covenant. Now, we read and get into the scripture. We're not going to get into all the different covenants at this point in time. But there was at least seven different covenants that God made with the children of Israel. Promises for different reasons. And he made it to different individuals. All of them, didn't, some was made through Abraham, through Moses. And, you know, we won't get into all those tonight. But there were like at least seven different covenants. One of the covenants was dealt with the ceremonial laws. And the circumcision was a part of those laws, but it started with Abraham. So now, moving forward, the, the circumcision of the foreskin is no longer necessary a part of the covenant with God. It Now it moves on to the circumcision of the heart, moving the way the foreskin of the heart. That is done through salvation. So their part of salvation, even before the, the covenant was made with Moses in the wilderness, was through the tabernacle covenant. Their part of salvation was through the cutting of the foreskin. That was sealing the, not only the promise, but sealing every male child. Every male child. Sealing them with God through the circumcision. No, not only did he say, and you got to understand this and see the revelation behind, it wasn't just the seed of Abraham. It was everyone that he bought, everyone that came in under their camp. Because if you go study this and you go see further scriptures that he talked about, it was everyone that would even came in to dwell with them. If they came in to cohabitate with them, they had to take part. If there was a male child, doesn't matter how old he was when he came in, he had to be circumcised. Think about it. Uh, 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 Abraham was already grown and he had to be circumcised. It wasn't until after that point where he said the eighth day, so blessed be the ones that came after that that was able to be circumcised at a young child rather than you grown 
you know, and have to go through that and deal with that pain because even as a child, as a baby, you did you don't remember that. I know I don't remember. You don't remember that that, that pain, you know. So I thank God that that happened, and, and you know when it happened. But that was the covenant and the promise that was made. So no longer is the circumcision. It's still a covenant with Israel, but it's not up till salvation. Jesus Christ Himself not only abolished all of that, but He fulfilled it. So it's no longer by just the, for, the cutting away the for, uh, foreskin of the flesh, but it's the circumcision of the heart. That is the salvation. That if you believe, when you believe, and that's why people get into believing with your heart, with the heart, with the mouth, with the heart, man believes, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. When you make the confession, something will happen. Everybody that you read in the scriptures that believed and confessed the Lord Jesus Christ was saved. Something happened. They didn't just confess and went and sat down and nothing happened. No, There was no transformation in their lives. Just something happened. The Holy Ghost presented itself. There was an event that followed them believing. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. So yes, it takes more than just me believing and confessing with my mouth. I have to still be filled with the Holy Ghost according to the word of God and according to what we see and have read in the book of Acts. You know, I try to admonish and tell people, you know, even those that follow this broadcast and follow, you can't really depict and understand and follow what we're saying by listening to the first five minutes of the broadcast or, or, or listening to one. You, you must follow, you must see and get the whole story, just like you can't take the word of God. And read one scripture and think you can determine all that what God commanded by reading one scripture. You have to read the whole Bible. You have to understand the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation to understand the whole picture that God is painting through the word of God that he left through his holy apostles. Amen. So we see that this is one of the reasons why now these gentlemen have decided now that they want to tell the church that you need to be circumcised to be saved. This is another gospel that is being preached. And this is this is like outside of the will of God. And, and like, I was, like I was stating earlier, one of the things I want to mention is, like I was just talking about, is where, where, where a lot of people are preaching that, you know, all you have to do is confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that, you, you know, that Christ was raised from the dead, you should be saved, which means they're quoting Romans 10 and 9. They also now then they taking um Ephesians. We're talking about which we're gonna read tonight. We're talking about grace. It's talking about grace and say we're saved by grace. That's become a doctrine within itself, salvation by grace. So you you have a lot of churches that believe in the doctrine that we're saved by grace alone. Then you have the other doctrine, which is by faith alone. Now, those are let me just say three different, three different doctrines concerning salvation. If you add the one in uh, uh, Acts chapter 15, the first verse, that's four doctrines so far that is preached from the word dealing with salvation. Four. Because here he said by circumcision for them to be saved is dealing with what? They had to be circumcised. What is the gospel? Dealing with the preaching of the gospel is dealing with what salvation. So even the doctrine concerning saved by grace alone or saved by faith alone is talking about salvation. Salvation deals with preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now you see different doctrines that are set in and that are put in. And God, Jesus, none of the disciples instituted none of this. If you want to understand the gospel that they were preached. You must understand the first few book, the first few chapters of the book of Acts. You must understand the teachings uh, of Jesus Christ that he that was written uh, within um, the four uh, gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You must understand that and be able to rightly divide the word of truth. So in our notes, we says, so now after Paul and Barnabas disputed with the men of Judea, they bring this matter to the rest of the apostles. And see, I like that. That's what we must do today. When we have things and issues going on, rather than sitting arguing and arguing with people, so what they did is they this matter was so important because they went not only here, but they went throughout the churches spreading this heresy, spreading this false doctrine. And it became an issue. Paul and Barnabas argued with those men concerning the doctrine. So basically they were saying, I tell you what, let's settle this. 
let's take this matter to the rest of the minute, rest of the apostles, and let's discuss this. So when they did, we get Peter standing up. So the next thing we see is the council. The council is discussing they concerning, you know, this matter. So what they did, they went and prayed and they sought God concerning the matter. Verse 19 to 29, which we just read, the apostles reached a decision, and not on decision, a plan of action through the Holy Ghost. What was the plan of action? He said that we would the decision was that let's, let's, so we won't misquote it. Let's read the decision. And the plan of action, because when I want to tell people, when you complain about something, have a decision and a complain uh, and a plan of action. Don't just sit there and complain about things. I tell folks in church all the time: people want to complain about what the pastor's not doing, complain about what people are not doing in the church. When you're complaining about something, or you find something as the problem, before you bring it to forefront and you complain about it, have a plan of action. Have a way out instead of a complaint. They wasn't just complaining about it, but they went and sought the Lord about it, and they came up with a plan of action, what to do. See, I like it when God, when the Holy Ghost speaks and gives the plan of action, because it's going to always be backed up by the Word of God. Let us read. It says, uh, um, let's go start the 19th verse. It says, wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them. This was the solution. This was the solution. It says, wherefore, my, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them, this is the plan of action now. The plan of action is that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. That was the plan of action and that was the instructions that he said that they was going to write to them. We know according to the letters and we read and understand the scriptures, it was more put into that. But that was the main part of the letter that they was going to write to all the churches is that they would stay, would stay from those things. That was the whole idea. And if you understand what we're going to get into tonight, a lot of the letters and the, that Paul wrote and the things that he addressed in some of the scriptures we're going to talk about tonight, these were issues, ceremonial laws that even after this day, there were those that still went out to the different churches and preached this doctrine. So Paul, Paul preceded a lot of times and preached the doctrine. He had, we see in Galatians, which we'll read, where Paul had to go back and straighten them out. Because he already straightened out the issue. And we'll get on, we'll be seeing how Paul had to deal with certain these things. And a lot of these things came about because of this incident, because of the letter. That's why I say when we read the scripture, we can't read all of these chapters of scriptures as these are just certain separate incidents that happen. Everything links up together. All the scriptures in the Bible links up together. So these scriptures that Paul wrote to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, and uh, uh, Colossians, all of this, these were issues that came about in the church that he had to deal with concerning a lot of isms and schisms that had in the church. It's considered marriages. Some were sleeping with folks' husbands, different things that he dealt with. And a lot, a lot of things that he dealt with, he dealt with the Gentiles concerning the ceremonial laws. A lot of things that was after they had went and preached, that was came back was tried to be reinstituted to them. So what he was doing was reaffirming the fact that they were saved. He was reaffirming how God came to them through Jesus Christ. So when you understand the reading of the letters and you understand the book of Acts, that's why I started with this series dealing with the book of Acts because Acts deals with the beginning and the setup of the church. We must understand that Acts is the beginning, the guideline, and the tool of the setting up of the church. The church dealing with even the Jews and the Gentiles. What happened, things they dealt with. That's why I say this 15th chapter marks the setting and the different things that happened that we see proceeding after the book of Acts. So when you, from this day forward, when you understand and you get the 15th chapter in your mind, I encourage you, even after we finish this broadcast, go and take your time. Read the 15th chapter of Acts. And then when you get into reading out after Romans, some of Romans and after Romans, look at the letters that Paul wrote. Look at the stuff he dealt with. Your mind is automatically going to refer right back. Your spirit is going to take you right back to the 15th chapter of Acts. They only dealt with circumcision. Circumcision was by ceremonial laws. This wasn't the only issue they dealt with. There was a whole lot of other issues, but the main issue that was on the table was the was the, the law dealing with circumcision. That's going to come up again. So that was the plan of action. The a part two of the plan of action was not just write a letter, 
but he was going to send along with Barnabas and Paul. They sent other men along with Paul and Barnabas to not only deliver the letter, but also teach them. You see how God will do? He still, still today, and that's the important part, and I must say this to those that are calling themselves apostles, this is the work of the apostle. When churches are in error, the job of the apostle is to go and set the house in order. Put things the way they're supposed to be according to the word of God. You trying to figure out why is your ministry not being effective? Why your ministry, things are not happening the way God planned for your ministry? And you, you're doing the best you can. The house is not in order. A lot of times it takes the, the commission and sending of the apostles to come. Paul ain't coming. <laughs> Peter ain't coming. Barnabas not coming. He has apostles in the earth today. Not everybody that's calling themselves apostles because there was a lot of there was many as we read in the scripture even in that day that was calling themselves apostles that God did not ordain. They did not walk with the twelve. There was many disciples that was at one point with the twelve, but they left out and they went out from among them spreading different doctrines, spreading different things that was not of God. So it is a very important saints of God that we must understand. We got to get this thing. When it comes to the church, God has a way of setting up his church. He has an order. The order has not changed since the scripture, even since this council right here. This is a guideline and a tool that we are to use as men and women of God when we have issues in the church. How we deal with the issue? Consult God. Consult the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost be your lead. Let the Holy Ghost be the guide. And the tool to straighten out these matters. And it's going to always refer back to the scripture. And I guarantee you, if it's the Holy Ghost, the house will be put in order. Amen. Before we go any further, we got a question online. And um, I'm going to take this, take this question real quick. Amen. Let me see here. Hello. Welcome to the Truth and Guidance Show. You are on the air. God bless you. Can you uh, introduce yourself? Bless you, bless you. Mm hmm Uh-huh. <clears throat> Amen. 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 I thank you for those for those comments. Like I said, it's important we must understand. And the point we're making tonight is concerning circumstances, this was a different gospel and and uh the the call the what the point the call is bringing out is dealing with this uh what Paul preached about what we're talking about tonight is concerning the circumcision, but you know, but they were preaching another gospel. This was another gospel. And as we begin to read, and our next reference scripture is going to be Galatians. We're going to be in the book of Galatians. Um, it's, it's going to be our next reference scripture. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 9. And you're going to see why I'm bringing out the point of this gospel. This is another gospel. Because, again, as I stated before, this is something that is being done within the churches today. People are taking, and, and 
I have to, I have to re reiterate and really fine tune this point. It's important. People's lives and their soul is at stake, and they are, and the world is relying on us as preachers and teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to number one, tell them the truth. Number two is to rightly divide the word of truth. So we have to, if, you can't rightly divide the word of truth if you don't know the truth. And so just like, again, my point of bringing out and highlighting that first verse in uh, Acts 15 and 1 is he's talked about, they talked about circumcision dealing with salvation. And you have to see the enemy in this. So again, like I named three other doctrines concerning salvation. Salvation through grace alone. Salvation through faith alone and confessing with your mouth. And that's it. When Jesus never taught those things as that is the, those are principles. Those are a part of salvation. You need to have faith. We're all saved by grace. We all have to believe. But after something happens, as we understand the scripture says, without, uh, it, it says without faith, number one, is impossible to please God. Faith without works is dead. So after you believe, your works is, is obeying the scripture. It is nothing that you do on your own. Like, cause when the scripture talks about that, which I don't want to jump the gun, it talks about, uh, you know, you, there's no, nothing of your own that you've done. You can't do nothing because with the whole teaching at that point in time and that time was people were thinking that you can do something. What did the rich young ruler ask? You, you, again, saints of God, link up the scriptures. The rich young ruler didn't just pop off out of his head somewhere out of the cloud and say when we in, in Matthews in the 19th chapter of Matthews when he said, um, Master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? He wanted to be saved. He wanted eternal life. He said, What good thing? People thought and think there is something that they can do to be saved. Something do I mean, example. Simple example. Would it, he had to say, okay, feed, go out and feed the homeless, homeless, because that's something Jesus talked about. Those that, and also Matthew, about those that was on um, clothing, those that need to be clothed, feeding the homeless, visiting those in jail. So let's just say all those things he said, well, I don't did all those things, you know, um, because he did something. I kept all the commands from my mother's, you know, I've done all of that. But what he said, well, I don't, I don't want to feed the hungry. I, don't, I went and visited the prisons, and, and I visited the sick and the widows. I've done all these things, so can I have eternal life? What he's saying is, because I've done those things, I should be able to have eternal life and have salvation to be saved. No, it is nothing that you can do to be saved except, except obey the voice of God. Obey what God has set forth. The order he set forth started with what he said to Nicodemus. John chapter 3, except a man be born of water and spirit, he shall not enter the kingdom of God. Folks, crack me up trying to break that and separate that, you know, and try to break it down, say he wasn't meaning this, he wasn't meaning that. He said, except the man be born of water and spirit, he shall not enter the kingdom of God. So a lot of people thinking another doctrine that they could, they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to be baptized. You got some people believing where well, I can be baptized, but I don't have to have the Holy Ghost to be saved. When people believe in saying, well, I can get the Holy Ghost because there are many people in the scripture that got the Holy Ghost prior to uh, um, baptism. The completion of that was the baptism. There were some that was baptized before they got the Holy Ghost. There were some that got the Holy Ghost and that was baptized. So it goes hand in hand. That's why he said, and I thank God that the, the writer recorded that, that said, except the man be born of water. And spirit, he should know. He will know why. See the kingdom of heaven. So we must understand. You can't do it. You can't take away the scripture. You cannot take away the scripture. So let's go to Galatians chapter one, starting at verse six. Galatians chapter one, starting at verse six says, "I marvel that ye are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another what gospel? What was another? What was the another gospel? We're going to find out." Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or any angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we are have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we ye have received, let him be accursed. So again, anybody that comes up dealing with salvation and tells you that there is another way to be saved other than that was preached by the apostles in the book of Acts, the scripture says he is accursed. I agree with the scripture. I say what the scripture says, that you are a curse. If you are out there preaching any other gospel other than that was preached by the apostles and Jesus Christ himself, you are a curse. What is the gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection. We must be buried with him. We have to go down in that liquid grave and be brought up and we will receive the Holy Ghost. Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall, that is a promise, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift, it is a gift from God. There's nothing you can do to earn this gift but obey and have faith. That's the only thing you can do to earn that gift. That's it. That's it. If you want to say, what can I do? Is obey the scriptures, obey God. So what was the doctrine? What was the gospel that somebody came and preached to them? After this matter concerning circumcision was already dealt with, someone still came to the Galatians preaching this same doctrine concerning um, circumcision, and they began to believe it. They began to argue among themselves. So Paul had to come and deal with them on this. That's why he said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed. Why he say so soon removed? Because he just dealt with this. He had just dealt with this thing. Just dealt with it. So again, you see a point, you see how even that now do you do you think and you see how we linked up Galatians with that very first chapter of Acts chapter the verse, verse of Acts chapter 15. Now don't you see all of this we just read and if you, if you read take your time out and read the book Galatians, you'll see all that in Acts chapter 15, the whole chapter 15. That's right. Amen. I thank God for the word of God. Let uh, God the word of God be true every man be a lie. Why point this out? Just as the men of Judea tried to preach another gospel, preachers and teachers have used these same scriptures to preach another gospel. We know that the gospel is the preaching of the death, burial, and resurrection, salvation. Notice the men of Judea said they need to be circumcised to be saved. That's another gospel. We pointed that out. When men attempt to misuse other scriptures to bring about salvation, other than that, what the apostles preached in the book of Acts and what Jesus himself preached, they are accursed. These next few scriptures we will show how Paul teaching and correcting the same subjects in another chapter. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 4. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4. Uh, we still, if you're tuning in, coming in late, we still, we in Acts chapter 15. And uh, again, we dealing with we, our reference scriptures. So far, we dealt with Genesis. Um, we, 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 we Genesis, I put my paper down. Genesis, our first reference scripture was Genesis chapter 17, verses 10 through 14. Our next one was, was Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. And now we're in Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to restart at verse 4 down to 22. I like to get witnesses. Scripture said, out of mouth for two or three, two or three witnesses, let every word do be what? Established. So I like to get witnesses. I like to show you again. That's why I say I, like, I use the term linking up the scripture, link up the word of God, because there is nothing that we won't preach or we don't preach here on, on, on the truth and guidance that we cannot show you throughout the scripture, whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament, because we believe the word of God be be true. We believe the word of God to be that what it is. You know, problem I I, I see that we have in a lot of churches. <clears throat> and then I, I, I want to say our church world and community. This was not always the case, but as of lately, I'm going to say this: the last 20 years, mainly, the last 20 years, I remember when I was younger, we saw a lot of preaching, but we had more teaching than we had preaching. Number one, it was because of the church I, I came up in and the bishop that we had. He was a teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he believed that it was important, more important that he teach once the gospel was preached and those were saved. He believed that it was important to preach to you 
how to live. To te- I'm sorry, to teach to you how to live. To teach you what God requires for us. To teach the Bible. To help us understand and write the right word of truth. And throughout, even from even from outside of him, a lot of other men and, men and women of the gospel that I knew and we ran across, they were teachers of the gospel. They teach people spent time teaching. You know, you had conventions where they had encounters where they 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 taught. They had seminars where they taught. They taught the word. It wasn't a lot of preaching going on. But why you keep making a difference between preaching and teaching? There is a vast difference between preaching and teaching. See, if I was preaching the message to you, I just pull out a scripture. And deal with an issue. I would deal with just an issue concerning, you know, and say, you know, and take this. I'm gonna give you a, a prime example. You know, I, I, I like we, we, and I have done this. I've taken the, uh, the, the, um, the situation where when Paul the Barnabas was locked up in prison, when he was locked up, I have a message. I wrote a message concerning that, them being in prison, and I take that and talk about the prisons of your life. I'm preaching something off of that, but am I using that scripture and teaching you what happened with Paul and Barnabas, or Paul and Silas rather, in prison? Teaching you what happened with them, everything, what was the meaning, what, what was that all about? But we can take a verse of scripture and we preach a good inspiration of gospel to you, I preach something to you, even if you're preaching to Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection, that is preaching. But then if I teach it to you, I'm breaking it down to where you can understand it. A lot of times when you're preaching, you don't always cross reference scriptures because you're trying to get a point across to the people. But when you're teaching, then you're trying to make sure they understand the point that you're trying to get across. I could show you how to ride a bike and show you and give you the principles of how to ride a bike. But then if I teach you, take my time and teach you the fundamentals of riding a bicycle, when you fall, you will be able to get up and start backpedaling. If I only preach the gospel to you and you fall, you might have a hard time getting up. But if I teach you how to live and how to walk, if you fall, you will know how to get back up and keep moving. That's one of the main difference of preaching and teaching the gospel. Tonight, we're teaching. On Truth and God is we believe in teaching. Teaching you how to stand, how to live. Teaching what the word of God says. Amen. So Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 4, says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Boom. Because of that, you see right there? By grace, you are saved. Mark that, underline that. Sixth verse. And he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Eighth verse, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We just said that, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm going to stop right there for a moment. We must understand, and this is what I was talking about. How can you, seriously, think about this for a moment. Did you put your thinking caps on, caps on. You know, like I said, you know, this is one of the points of time where you say, hmm, I need you to think for a moment. Let's slow down. We read, we just read, and if you're following, we from we started Acts chapter one, and we read the we read the preaching of the gospel beginning with Peter. We see Stephen preached the gospel, Philip preached the gospel, as well as Peter and John preached the gospel. We see Paul preached the gospel. All of them preached the same thing. You got to see this. They preach the same thing. They, were, they may have slight variations. If you haven't been following, go back, listen to the listen to our prior broadcast when we first started in the book of Acts, or you go just read it yourself. They all preach the same. They may have slight different variations of the gospel, but they preach the same thing, saints of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection. This is what they preached. Nowhere did they say to them, 
and leave it, even if they did use the term I leave it, that by grace you are saved and saved alone. So, if we understand that the book of Acts is the beginning of the church and the setup of the church, after this, after the book of Acts, as we have always stated, there is no more teaching of salvation to the church because the church was established during, during this time. The gospel has already been preached at this time in the book of Acts. So all of the letters were sent to the churches. The churches meaning folks that have gotten saved through the preaching and the teaching of the apostles. So there was no there was no reason to preach another. Paul, we just read in Galatians, Paul said, though he or any other angel, if anyone preach any other gospel, then that which they had already received, let him be a curse. So then for them to stand up and say, okay, now a new doctrine is you don't have to be baptized in Jesus' name. You don't have to receive the Holy Ghost. You're only saved by grace alone. That's another doctrine. That's another gospel. Because what you're telling them, that, and when people are preaching, look at, go research it yourself. Research the doctrine saved by grace alone. This is their fine foundational scripture for this doctrine. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, is you will always find this is their foundational scripture. How are you going to skip all of the book of Acts Go into the church, get one verse, and establish a whole doctrine. What did we read in Acts chapter 15? He said, except they be circumcised by the law of Moses, that they wouldn't be they couldn't be saved. He told them that's in order for them to be saved. This was another doctrine. You see why I'm making this point? I'm linking all this together. You cannot preach another gospel other than that was preached by the apostles. They laid the foundation has already been laid. Only thing we can do is build up on it. You cannot lay another foundation. I promise you, if I tonight start tonight, January the 21st, 2014, if I start tonight preaching salvation by grace alone, or through grace alone, I am preaching another gospel. I am accursed. You must understand this. I'm not going to do this because I don't believe it. I believe in the word of God. Then that means I am not building on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being what? The chief cornerstone. Every building has a foundation. What foundation are you building on? We have to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. The foundation built on the foundation of Jesus Christ goes back to what? Preaching the gospel. The death, burial, resurrection. You're going to hear this ring out from here to eternity. I will not change the gospel. I, I can't do it. I can't change the gospel. That's the only gospel. The good news. What was the good news? What was the good news? What was the good news? That he died and he rose again. Spread the news that this Jesus that was promised to us came. He died, gave his life on the cross. He was buried and he rose again and he showed himself to the twelve as witnesses. He needed witnesses. He had 12 witnesses. Four of them wrote about it. Four of them wrote about it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But there were more than four witnesses. He said, out of mouth. You see, Jesus himself said, out of mouth for two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. So the gospel was established by four witnesses. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You must understand the scriptures and rightly divide the word of the truth. Amen. So we see how they use this eighth verse as, as a foundation of scripture when it's yet is erroneous teaching. It is not the gospel. We are saved by grace, yes. And we this you gotta understand this. Paul was writing a letter to the church in Ephesus. These are Gentiles that were saved. Even there were some Jews that was there. But this is the Gentile church that was saved. He was letting them know because of some of the things that arose, the problems and issues dealing with ceremonial laws that arose at this time. And he would let them know that, you know, that we're saved too, but it was by grace that we all saved. It was not by our works. Let us keep reading so we can finish laying this, this part of the foundation. Amen. We stopped at the ninth verse, the tenth verse. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus Unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, who? Gentiles. So that lets you know who is he talking to. When he says right here, 
that ye being in time past Gentiles. The Jews was not Gentiles. He's letting you know right there that he's talking about to the Gentiles, those that had gotten saved. This is to the church. That in the flesh, he said, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. We talked about that in the beginning. That was the cutting away for the foreskin of the flesh. That at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. You see why I, I established earlier about the covenant? That the circumcision dealt with a covenant and a promise? You see, this Paul dealing with the same thing. Again, you've got to be able to go from Genesis to the back of the book to establish and understand the word of God. There is not, even though they're separate books, but it all tells one story. It's all about Jesus. Jesus was in the garden. And we see him in Revelations. We see Jesus in every book. You can't get, you can't get, you can't get past him. You can't get past him. It's all telling one story. So he's letting them know that uh, 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 we're not strangers anymore from the from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition between us. What was the middle wall of petition that between us? Go in the tabernacle. What was the middle wall of petition? The laws, the ordinances, the middle. Those are things that kept us out. And then when they built the temple, they had to what? The court of the Gentiles because the Gentiles could not come. Even though they were always, you look at how God, always, the Gentiles was always there. Why have the court of the Gentiles? If it was never in the plan of God for them to be saved, they were always there. But they, at that point in time, we could not come in. We couldn't go in. We couldn't even make sacrifices. Sacrifices couldn't even be made for us. But they had the court of the Gentiles because they were there. Because And they were there in the, in the, in the point of some were slaves, some were actually married to some of the Jews at that point in time, some of Israel. But they were always there. They, they cohabitated with them. Go, go back in the book of Judges. You'll see that. Look in Deuteronomy, you'll see it. It's right there. It's right there. You can't miss it. It's right there. I think it's in the very beginning of the book of Judges. How they they, they refused as um, when God told them to run out their habits of the land. They didn't do it. So they were always there. So when they had the tabernacle, that wall that was there, that kept, that separated us, we couldn't even go into the tabernacle. There was a curtain that also separated them from the, ho the holies of holies. So all of that through Jesus Christ, the middle wall petition was broken down, was torn. God abolished it through the blood of Jesus Christ. And his flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained where? In ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace, excuse me, so and making peace. So in one new man, if you look at it, through Jesus, Israel, the Jews, the Gentiles coming together along with Jesus Christ, instead of having twain, every coming together in Jesus Christ, we're all one. Don't that sound like a marriage? That you're no longer twain, you're one? See, this is why it's important for husbands and wives, to the best of your ability, to let Satan get Satan out of your marriages, get folk out of your marriages. Stop letting folk destroy your marriages because it was never in the plan of God for divorce. It was never in the plan of God. But because of folk letting people get into their marriage, listening to other folks, marriages are destroyed. Because when you, how can something that becomes one be torn apart? How can it become two except we tear it apart? The whole idea is when you become one, that you stay one. But it's through the Satan that wants to destroy the institution of marriage. That's why I say, when, when they say, what well, God has put together, let no man uh, uh, put asunder. He was talking about man and woman. He was talking about the institution of marriage. And I will go a, step, a couple of steps ahead and say this. A lot of times, there are folks that are together. God ain't never put you together. God ain't never, God ain't never put them together. 
But if you are together, make sure that you're equally yoked. Make sure that you come together and try to the best of your ability to find God and put God in your life that you can't stay together. Again, God's word is true. He never planned, even when he gave uh, um, Israel a bill of divorcement. God, he, he, taught, he threatened Israel to divorce them because of their sin. That's why he's unmarried to the backslider. He told them, I'm going to divorce you, give you the bill of divorcement. Because they they backslid, they did so so many things that was wrong. Wow. You got to understand this. What did Paul say in his writings? And I'm going to get back to my scripture. You got to look at what Paul said. See, there's a spiritual and a natural to everything. Paul said, except for fornication. Told the man, except for fornication, that's to the woman, that you don't put your husband or your wife away, except for fornication. If you actually go back and you read the prophets and you read Jeremiah, but you'll find it mainly in Jeremiah, where he would he prophet told them because they were whoring after other gods, they were committing fornication, they were married to Jesus, and they were committing fornication. And so, why did he threaten to give them a bill of divorcement because of the fornication? Well, how was they fornicating? They were going after other gods. They were sleeping, laying with other gods. So the, in the spiritual, in, in the spiritual sense of them going after horn after other gods, as they as said in Jeremiah and the other, uh, the other prophets, that caused God to get angry. And He said, "I'm because of that. I'm gonna give you a bill of divorcement if you don't straighten up." What do one spouse tell the other spouse? If you keep what cheating, horn after that woman, horn after that man, I'm gonna divorce you. It's the same thing, thanks to God. Paul didn't make this up. He didn't get it. He understood what the prophet was talking about. This is what happened with Israel. You have to see this in the spiritual and the natural. It's the same thing. Everything God don't tell different stories. All of it still winds up and still goes together. The same thing. If you out there commit, and even today as a church, folks still out there are committing adultery. And I'm going to tell you like this. Folks are committing fornication and adultery on God and the devil. Well, how do you say that? You got folks that are supposed to be saved and claim to be saved. They leaving out and going and worshiping the devil. You got some folks that are supposed to be straight sinners up there sitting in church, singing and praising and singing on the choir and preaching, and yet they, they know they're supposed to be worshiping Satan. Why do you say they're supposed to be worshiping Satan? Because they ain't saved? Because guess what? He, ye who you yield your members to or your servants to. So if, yes, if, 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 if from Sunday after you leave church to, to Sunday morning the next following Sunday, you out there, you you doing everything that you say you big and grown enough to do. You committing all kinds of sins, doing all kinds of stuff. But then you get in church Sunday, now you want to sing in the choir, pray, sing, playing the instruments, dancing, shout, speaking tongues, preach, prophesy, and all that stuff like that. You're cheating on the devil. Because if you're yielding your members to the devil, then you are servants of the devil. That's who you married to. So you're even cheating on the devil. You can't even be faithful to the devil. There are folks out there cannot be faithful to Satan. That's why he. That's why Satan is taking a lot of folk out of here. Before they get it right, he's snatching them out of here, killing them, destroying them. Before they have a chance to receive, to hear and, and and come in. I ain't gonna say hear the gospel because every man before he leave the earth to hear the gospel. Before they can have a chance to accept the gospel, accept the truth, he's taking them out of here. So just like folks cheat on the devil, they cheat on God. They say they belong to God, but out there tiptoeing. Doing things that are not pleasing to the sight of God. Yes, he will divorce you because he will turn away from you and say, I don't know you. And the proof of that divorce, when he says in the end, depart from ye that work iniquity, I don't know you. I never knew you. I never knew you. I never knew you. You know what that's like? You know what that's like? That's like a common law marriage. A common law marriage. man can live with a woman, a woman live with a man for 20, 30 years, and, and something they, they decide to separate, and they act like they never knew the person. There was no marriage. There was no paperwork. There was nothing. And they and they like it like that, so they can walk away scot free, and so they think nowadays scot free because the, the law of the land is a lot of places don't change now. You can actually get what they call palimony now. So you have to understand everything in the scripture. It ain't nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. <clears throat> Amen. Back to the script. Back to the scripture. Amen. Where did I leave off at? Okay. I'm. Let me go up to come in Ephesians. Where did I leave off at? Okay. Fourteenth verse. For he is our peace, and who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition between us is having is 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man. So making peace and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, excuse me, and came and, pre and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners and fellow citizens with the, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows unto the holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Amen. So you see again, that right lets you know he's talking to the church. And who was the church? These were some of the Gentiles at this point in time that gotten saved. Saints of God, and if you are a preacher, if you are a teacher of the gospel, and, and, and you, you have been teaching this, understand the word. Understand the word. I say to you, and I beg you, to seek God for truth and stop leading people. The world, again, like I said in the beginning of the broadcast, the world is looking for us to be able to tell them the truth and rightly divide the word of truth. If in the book of Hebrews he said, Obey them that have rule over you, for they watch for your soul, and that they do it without fear and trembling. How can you watch for my soul if you don't know the truth, if you're not preaching and teaching truth? This is why I say anybody that goes after being a pastor, being a leader, you gotta be crazy out your mind twice, ten times over. Because you are you are responsible for making sure. That every soul on the sound of your voice, every soul that you have been committed to, that they make heaven. Now, if they don't because of their sins, that's on them. That's why he, the scripture was saying to us as lay members, he says, Obey them that have rule over you, for they watch for your soul. You got to understand this. So, there's some of God got somebody watching for your soul. If I have, as a pastor, have to watch for your soul, then that means how I watch for your soul is giving you and preaching to you the true, unadulterated word of God. If me giving you the truth, giving you what it takes, you will change doctors. If you continue going to the doctor and you can five, six years, you, you won't even let it get that far. And you're still dealing with the same ailments you still deal with the same situation. You gonna change doctors? Well, you have to do the same thing. Think the same way about the church. If that preacher is not delivering you, you are not finding deliverance from your issues, and you are really sick and true. Then you need to find you another spiritual doctor. You need to pray and ask God to lead you somewhere where the truth is being preached and taught. Amen. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. Our last, oh no, is it our last? No, um, no, it's not our last one. We got two more. And we did, but our last book is Colossians. Let me speed up here. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 8 to 23. That's why I say the 15th chapter. I didn't, I didn't think I could come out the 15th chapter tonight. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 to 23. And then the last one's going to be Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 11. Beware. What's the first word? Beware. Warning. Anytime you see, beware, that's a warning. Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the, the, the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That still right there goes right back to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and power. Now, if... I am the church. If I am the church, right? And this letter's been written to me. I'm just getting it written to me. And he's telling me I am complete. If you are complete already, then why why would you preach salvation or teach me salvation again if I'm already complete? That's why I'm telling you, you can't go in these books and find the plan of salvation. You can't do it. It ain't there. Only thing he's doing, he's reidentifying. And he's solidifying what God has already given them. He's reminding them. This is a reminder. 
Re -re he's reminding them. He is not preaching another gospel, saints of God. You got somebody got to get this and understand this. He's not preaching another gospel. <clears throat> you say we're complete in him, which is the head of all, principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. See, first we dealt with the circumcision made with hands, which is what the cutting of what the way the four flesh of the flesh. Now the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the, and, and, uh, excuse me, the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphantly over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. Catch this point right here. It says he had made a show of them openly, triumphant over them in it. Catch this point. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which are, excuse me, which he have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increases with the increase of God. Wherefore ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. Say what? Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men? Now, I'm going to read that without the parentheses. I'm going to read that without the parentheses. As though living, he says, okay, let me go back up. Wherefore, if ye be dead, excuse me, wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances after the commandments and doctrines of what? Men. Now, go back to the parentheses. He said, touch not, the, what was the orders that they were people talking about? Don't touch this. Don't taste this. Don't handle this. Which all are the users of the parish of the using. Which all are to perish with the using. So these things, the ordinances were after the commandments of men and not of God. So this goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, what people do and why this 15th chapter. So I'm going to sum up in my last, after we read, after this, the whole 15th chapter of, uh, 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 of Acts is summed up in, in this last part of this, this um, scripture. How is that? We're going to show you in a minute. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Now, how is all of that wrapped up in here? I want to read this, and I'm going to read it slow, so you get this before I go. I'm going back into Acts. The 20th verse says, Wherefore, he's asking a question. If ye be dead with Christ, have anybody ever seen a dead man walk? No. Do you dead with Christ from the rudiments of who? The world. Why? As though living. He said, why? Meaning, why? As If you're supposed to be dead, why are you acting as though you're alive? In the world, are you subject to the ordinances after the commandments and doctrines of men? Now, what is that? Commandments and doctrines of men. What was the first incident that happened in the 15th chapter of Acts? Talking about what ordinances and commandments. The circumcision. Peter and the rest of the disciples dealt with that when they went into the 20th, the 1920 verse. Said, we wrote, we're going to write this letter telling them to uh, abstain from things offered to idols and, 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 you know, don't commit fornication, different things. Now, 
All this come about because of those men. Now, what we have in our churches today, you look at a lot of folks' bylaws. Their bylaws for their church. Their ordinances. And a lot of them are not necessarily scripturally based. When I say scripturally based is you can't pick out all the ordinances and say, well, the only thing, if you're dealing with the works of the flesh that's in Galatians chapter 5, we all know the commandments. We don't do those things. We don't do things that's mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. I'm not going to go in and read all of that. We know those, all those things that are named. Those are works of the flesh. We don't do those things. We don't do the works of the flesh. We don't do them. He's letting them know you do not need all these bylaws, all these ordinances. Because what are the ordinances to do? What are the ordinances? And, and, I'm, and I'm smiling and I'm laughing because I, I get it. I understand when I when I read that scripture and I understand it. It's because the laws are to govern you. You got to get this. Laws are set to govern you to make sure you walk this way, walk that way, do this and do that. Those govern you. The laws that God gave Moses was to govern the people. To make sure that they knew what not to do and what to do and what not to do. What was pleasing and what wasn't pleasing. Now, guess what? God did not abolish the law through Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the law. He became the law. So now that we Jesus has died and rose again, we have those that are saved and have been baptized into him, as Paul was talking about. We are buried in him and rose in the likeness of him, the newness of life. So we're now dead. If you are dead in Christ, then you are dead to the things of the world. You don't need ordinances and bylaws. You don't need them. Because if you're dead, you can't do the things if you're dead. Because you're now, now that you're dead, the only thing that you're following and that gets got you alive is the spirit. You are dead to the world, but you're alive unto Christ. So you're not walking after the flesh. You're walking after the spirit. The spirit is the thing that got in you. So if I'm dead, I don't have to ever worry about an ordinance or a law. Because guess what? The Spirit of God, as we see in 1 John chapter 3, the Spirit can sin. There is no sin in the Spirit. So if I am walking in the Spirit of God, there is no way I can say I don't need ordinances because the Spirit of God himself, it is the ordinance. He himself would lead in God. You got to see this, understand this. That's just how simple it is. That's what he was saying right there. You don't need the order. I, I don't need to put in a bylaw with don't taste, touch not, taste not, handle not. I don't need to tell folks that if you are dead, then guess what? The spirit not going to touch this, taste this, and handle not. The spirit is not going to do those things. So the spirit of God is the one that's leading you and keeping you from doing that. The problem people have is they don't have the Holy Ghost. They're not being led of the spirit. That's why we, the churches have the ordinances. You have to see this. The reason why the church come up with these ordinances, they think they're doing God a favor. But the thing is, what you're doing is you're putting a yoke around the people's neck that they cannot bear themselves. This is why I say this 15th chapter is so important and understand the church is the day. If God called me as a minister and called me to the gospel to preach the gospel, then the call he gave me, there are certain things through the Holy Ghost he may refrain, tell me don't do or not to do. I don't put that yoke among the lay members' neck and the bond because they didn't they wasn't called to that. This is what he was saying in the 15th chapter. He said, We won't put no more burden, nothing on them, no more on them than these things. But here you go in these churches and you got these big old thick books of all these bylaws, where to go, where not to go, what to taste, what to touch, not what to handle, not. And Paul is saying in the scripture, those are ordinances of men. You don't need those things if you are dead in Christ. I thank God for the word of God. I thank God because when I understand that, that lets me know my freedom and liberty comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. It comes through the word of God. It comes through living after God. The ordinances were designed for men. If you are living in the world up under the world system, then all the laws, and you live outside of Christ, then those laws are a law unto you. That's what people don't understand when we talk about liberty and freedom in Christ. You're free from those laws through Christ because the Spirit is the law unto itself. It cannot sin. It cannot break the law of God. It won't go outside. It can't do it. It's not in Him, and it can't do it. You'll see that in 1 John chapter 3. 
So saints of God, you must understand, in order to live free and live as a dead man, is to live live in Christ. You must first die in Christ. That is the baptism that's talked about. Again, I thank God for the word of God. Let, uh, we're going to see, I'm going to read my last scripture. We can just, just sum this all up. Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 11. If ye then, understand this, we just talked about this. We, like we said, we got witnesses to back up everything we talk about. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are where? Above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things where? Above. Not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. God, I thank God for the word. And God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify. That means to kill, to destroy. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. <laughs> you see this? Says God. Oh, sexual affections where? On things above. You see that? Sexual affections on things above. You see he, he's talking about things on the earth. See, your flesh is on the earth. But your spirit is from above. So everything that you're dealing with, if you can't learn to walk in the spirit now, how are you expect to make it to heaven? Because your flesh ain't going to heaven. Your flesh ain't going nowhere. He said, uh, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affections, and conspicuous and covetousness, which is adultery, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. He said, put it away. Put it off, away from you. Put those things. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where the, excuse me, created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Amen. So you see right here, he's letting you know again, just like I said, this scripture backs up what I just said. All those things that he we just named is not going back. If you got those in your flesh, if you're doing those things, you're not going, I'm sorry, you're not going back with him. You're not going to inherit the kingdom. That's why I, I, it, it, it saddens me, and it breaks my heart as a teacher of the gospel when I hear preachers say and teach folk that you cannot live free from sin. That that that's sad for any preacher, man, woman of God, to tell anyone that you cannot live free from sin. We are to put off the old man. He said, mortify the deeds of the flesh. We are to live in the spirit. If you walk after the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. You sin when you fulfill the lust of your flesh. When you succumb to the lust of your own flesh is when you sin. So again, if you walk after the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. So then all day long, you can walk around free, sin free all day long. You can do, why would the scripture tell you to do something without giving you the way to do it? I thank God. I thank God. I believe in the word of God. I don't believe in man. I don't, when I say I don't believe in man, it's the doctrine of men. Let me make sure I make that plain and clear. I don't believe in the doctrine of men. That's why he's told the scripture. He said in the 20th verse, in the, um, Colossians chapter 2, in that 20th verse, he said, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances after the commandments and doctrines of men? Why? And then he would name, in the parentheses, he named it, touch not, taste not, handle not. He says, which all are to perish with the using, they're going to perish. So why are you dealing with those ordinances? I hope somebody understand me tonight. If you, if you are, if you, there's something, it, it, oh my God. 
if you are living after Christ, you don't have to sit there and be worried about, well, I hope I don't do this. I hope I don't do these laws, these laws, ordinances. You're not subject to them because the Spirit is not subject to them. And the whole key, as I said before, is living in the Spirit. And that's why I say, it, I, and, and I always question that. And a lot of times you question things, even at a young age, you don't understand why your spirit is in question. It wasn't time for God to show me that. But I remember, I remember a few years ago when the Lord opened up the 15th chapter to me because I began to question. I, I said, Lord, you know, every, all these churches talking about you, you're you, you, you going to sin if you, this, is a, this is a sin, that's a sin. And the, the main thing that made me search this out and look for it is when you always hear, that's why you hear me say, I don't teach and preach a lot of things telling folks, if you do this and you do that, you're going to go to hell, unless it's named in the scripture, unless it's said in the scripture. Now, there's some things the scripture may not name per se, but I guarantee you, I can go in the scripture and show you. I take like drinking. I will never, ever preach and tell a person or teach them, say, if you drink, you're going to hell, because the scripture, no one in the scripture ever said that. He said, if you are a drunkard, Drunkard, yes, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look in uh, 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 Galatians chapter 5, a drunkard. He didn't say that if you drank, because there's a lot of people that may drink something like wine. You don't mean you're a drunkard. No way in the scripture ever said it was a sin to drink wine. He said to the bishop, he said, if, uh, 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 if any man desire to offer a bishop, these are the good work. He's going on to the different orders. He said they can't be given to any wine. Why could the bishop be given to any wine? Why? Because, number one, you don't even want to risk being a drunkard. You don't ever want any of the counsel and the decision and the business decisions that you do as a bishop ever be influenced, or you don't ever want to be accused of you allowing wine to influence you in your decision making, in your counsel. You don't ever want to stand accused. He said the deacon, not too much wine. If you go in the Old Testament, the priest, he told the priest, they can, they can don't, if you, they know they can go make sacrifices, they can't drink wine. If, when it comes to making sacrifices, they can't drink wine. The only time you see in the scripture where he told when wine was ever forbidden was those that took the vow of the Nazarene. A Nazarite vow couldn't take any nectar, any, any fruit that produced nectar, they could not have it. He told them, after your vow has fulfilled, if you took the Nazarene vow for seven years and you fulfilled your seven your seven year in vow, then you can go back to drinking wine. Read your scripture. Go back and read your scripture. Read it. Find it. You'll find it there. So come my thing, I, I keep hearing all these things. People talk about when well, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. You putting yokes, preachers, you're putting yokes on people next that they cannot bear. This is why people are walking away from the church. They're leaving the church in droves because you you choking them. People are being choked out of the church. These are orders that they cannot stand and take without the Holy Ghost. So the choke, that's why they say these things we'll write unto them. These things. Everything else outside of that, man put that in the church. God did not put that in the church. Man did that. Choking folks out of the church. We must understand the state with the scripture. See, think the key, what you must understand, and I know some of our forefathers understood when they read the word. I know they understood this. That the more you fall in love with Christ, the more you fall in love with God. There are a lot of things that may not even be a sin that you just won't have a desire to do. Because it profits you nothing. There's a lot of things. There's nothing that's a sin of itself. There is a lot of things that the Holy Ghost will actually push you away from, say, you know, with abstain and withstand from this. That not necessarily may be a sin. What, what, the, what, the, what did Paul say in, in, in Hebrews chapter 12? Lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets you. Some things are not a sin. Some things are a weight that keeps you from God. So the Holy Ghost will lead you, Spirit of God will lead you in even those weights. There are things in my life that I have refrained from doing that really is not a sin. There's nothing wrong. I could not condemn someone else for doing it. But it is a weight that, that the Holy Ghost deemed necessary that I should refrain from that keep me from the things that I want from God. Because I want the pureness of his thoughts, of his mind. I want the wisdom and knowledge. The more I want from God, the more he pushes me away from things. Because it becomes a sacrifice. So the more I want God in me, the more things he begins to take out of me, the more things of the world I begin to lose interest in. You got to understand this. So do, because that's what God gave me, 
Am I supposed to put that yoke among my lay members' neck and say, oh, don't do this, don't do that? No, that's what God gave to me because I have to hear the voice of God. When God called the apostles and prophets, he called them to a high calling. There's certain things that they had to abstain from that he didn't tell the children of Israel, everybody else too, because of how he dealt with them. There are certain things Jesus Christ did not do and deal with because of who he was and his purpose. It was not to the rest of the apostles. It was not to everybody else. So that's why, again, that goes with rightly dividing the word of truth. That's when you understand this. This is what Paul was saying right here. All of that, that, that 20th verse is the whole, basically, 15th chapter, almost the whole 15th chapter of, of Acts about dealing with ordinances. And that's why I wanted to deal with that chapter and understand a lot of times what, what preachers are doing today, they are running folk out of the church with all these different ordinances that they're putting and they're giving. Because it is their own, this their understanding. And I, I I understand it. I get it. I understand it. You Some people try to look out for the people. But you got to understand that you have to use wisdom. Are you choking the life out of your saints by doing this? Are you running them away? There's an old saying, you cannot skin a fish before you catch it. So you got people in the church that's never been saved. They may be testifying. They may be working, doing things. They never have, they have never, they are converted. Let's say this. They are converted because they have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. They have confessed with their mouth and believed in their heart. They have not yet received the Holy Ghost. They have not yet been baptized in Jesus' name. They're converted. Their heart and their mind is converted. They have repented of their sins, but yet they have no keeping power. So it will make them hard. It will make it harder for them to abstain from the things that you and I can abstain from. It will make it harder than that because we're led, what, of the Holy Ghost. We're led by the Spirit. So now they have their struggling. And this is how the doctrine of people cannot live free from sin, saints can live free from sin, because the, the preachers that that instituted this doctrine, they, them themselves were not saved. They were going around establishing churches, setting themselves up as pastors and bishops and deacons and apostles and prophets, having church, and they themselves have not been saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. They have not been buried in Jesus' name. They have not died. They have not mortified the deeds of the flesh. They haven't put off anything. So they're str yet struggling to maintain the image of the preacher through their flesh and they're struggling. This is why they tell you through their philosophy, which is vain philosophy, that you cannot live free from sin. They're telling you because they will say, I'm telling you what by what? My own experience. Why? Because they have not crucified the flesh. So, yes, they are true. They are right because of their own experiences that you can't live free from sin because their own experience, they have not yet died. In their flesh. I guarantee you, those same preachers that preach that to you, if they get baptized, if they repent of their sins, get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for remission of their sins, and receive the Holy Ghost from that day forward, walk after the Spirit, I guarantee you that message will change. I promise you. I stake my life on it, that message will change. Let God's word be true and every man be a lie. That's why they preach that doctrine to you, and they preach it with conviction. Because they were only converted. And rather than sitting and being taught and allowing that, that conversion to take hold and to continue being taught and being filled with the Holy Ghost, they got up because someone said, oh, you sound like a preacher. Oh, your daddy was a preacher. Granted, oh, you're going to be a preacher. And they go out and because they sound, they have a tune and they sound good or have a way, or a, a charismatic way of dealing with people or can sing, they feel, oh, I must can preach. I must. God must be calling me to be a pastor. Oh, he must call me to be a preacher. And before ever being, and then they go to these schools and institutions and get a piece of paper and a license from the world. And because they got the license that is that is recognized by the states and government from the world. No preacher ain't laying hands on, no preacher ain't doing, God ain't adoring, ordain nobody. But now because they got this piece of paper, they set themselves up as church. Not only they'll do that, now I'm a bishop. Some, some, some of them bypass pastor and go straight to being a bishop. They ain't a bishop. They're only a bishop for two years. Now they're apostle. Now they go around establishing churches. And God has not sat them down. They have not been yet dealt with. But because they see and they're gathering people, they're looking at, they're looking at the fruit of their labor. Not God's labor. They're looking at the fruit of their labor and they say, God must be with us. Saints of God, there's nothing new under the sun. 
These things happen even in Paul in them days, Peter in them days. And when you read all of these letters that was written by Paul, James, Peter, and John, some of the, these issues I'm talking about right now in this broadcast, these are issues that were dealt with. There were false prophets, false apostles that went out and it was establishing. They was trying, they was establishing their own churches. They were preaching their own messages outside of the apostles. That's why he told them. He says, anyone, whether it be us, anyone, angel, anybody that's preaching the other gospel, then what we did you have received from us, let them be a curse. Because there were other people out there doing the same thing. Just because you don't read all of their stories in scripture, don't mean they were doing it. Trust me, they were doing it. When you get into reading, if you ever decide to go study, uh uh um uh, uh, the things of the Catholic Church, you start studying a lot of things that happen. A lot of the th things that have happened, the wars, how they fought against the saints. How is it that you call yourself the authority of God and you're going to fight against the saints? The ones that God called and destroyed them and set yourself up. And that's what Satan did. He went up and because the Bibles were supposed to basically all destroy. And if you read, go into reading history, they were trying to destroy and they went out. And they were destroying, and they were going to different countries, destroying the Bibles because they wanted that Catholic Church at that time wanted to have the only Bibles. So they were trying to destroy and made decree if anybody were caught with a Bible that they would be destroyed, they would be killed, and they would be burned. But thank God that He preserved His Word for us. The letters were preserved for us. That way we may have it. So that's why you get and you got all these different doctrines, all these different translation Bibles, and all these different doctrines that come up through that. Saints of God, you gotta be, you gotta study, especially, especially, and I'm gonna say it like this. If you say that God called you to preach or teach, whatever you're supposed to do, and you call to the ministry, it is your responsibility. At, I mean, I'm gonna say it like this: if you this is your first time hearing this from, and you're hearing it from me. Even if you may have been taught wrong from the beginning, even if you yourself have been teaching wrong, it is your responsibility if you're old people to preach and teach the truth to them. It is your responsibility to give them the opportunity to receive the truth. It is your responsibility for yourself to seek and teach the truth of God. It's your responsibility to do that. Because again, when you look at going Matthews, I believe it's chapter 7, when he said, not everyone is crying, Lord, Lord, we're making your kingdom. He also said, he said, there's going to be many that's going to say, Lord, I cast out devils in your name. I prophesied. I did all these things in your name. He's going to say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. A lot of times I'll say, I don't know you. But the scripture actually said, I never knew you. And that's worse. Because you can know somebody and then deny them. But the worst is... I, n I never knew you. Like I, I get people come and say, "Man, I know you. No, you don't. You don't know me, man. No, I don't. I never. I never. I never met you before." Damn it! No, I'm sorry. I I, I'm not being funny, sir, or ma'am. I never met you before. I never knew you. I never knew. And that's what he gonna say. I never knew you. Now God knows everybody, but when He said, I, when he, "The only way God knows us is through Jesus Christ." When He sees us, He's seeing His Son. When God looks at us, he's looking at the Son. We're sons of God. He sees Christ. He don't see your flesh. He don't see you. So those, and you got to understand, he's coming back for his, he's coming back for the church that bear his name. So if he said, I never knew you, that means you would never say if you never bore the name of Jesus Christ. That means all the churches you went out and established, all the preaching and prophesying that you went and did, all the spitting and crossing, laying on, hands, laying on hands, all the traveling that you did, all the feeding of the hungry that you done, all that stuff that you done, building shelters, all the good stuff that you done. He still said, I never knew you. I never knew you. He didn't even say, I don't know you. He said, I never knew you. Man, what would happen if you turn to your wife and you say to her right now, I, 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 I never knew, I don't know, I don't know you. I don't never knew you. Never knew you. You deny your wife. You talking about a problem. You deny your children. What if you go home? What if I go home right now to my, go home to my mama? And she said, who are you? This is me, Jane, your son. I don't know you. Mama, stop playing now. I, I don't know you. I never, Mama, stop playing now. I never knew. You You know what's going to happen to me? But you think about 
Jesus saying that to you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. This is the thing that made me decide to really study the word of God to make sure I will never be one of those ones because I want to make sure that I rightly divide the word of truth, that everything that God says that is required of me for salvation, that I adhere to it and that I do it. Why would you want to risk not making the heaven? Why would anyone want to risk that off of a, a doctrine rather than just come into what God said and be, just be born again? You on the sound of my voice, if you listen to me, let me I'm gonna say this. If you come up under the doctrine of faith alone, grace alone, or Romans 10 and 9 doctrine, that's all that you have to do. And I, I put emphasis of that all because it is a part of what you have to do, but it's not all that you have to do. Grace is a part of salvation, faith is a part of salvation because you can't get saved, saved without faith. It takes faith to believe and to get saved. It takes faith first of all, but being obedient. So all those different things. But if that's is that is the extent of your salvation, my brother, my sister, you must go a few steps further. You must obey the teaching of the apostles. You must obey the word of God that was handed down to us through the book of Acts. That is the teaching of the gospel that was given to us. There is no other gospel. You will find it. No other gospel. Nowhere else throughout the Bible. That's the gospel. In my closing, the letters that was written after the book of Acts were addressed to the church. The church is those that are saved. The church is those that bear the name of Christ. If they already bear the name of Christ, there was no need for the apostles to set up a new doctrine, a new gospel, a new plan of salvation. So if you're going into those books and your foundation for salvation is in those books, then you're wrong. That's not the foundation. Jesus Christ himself is the foundation. The foundation of being saved is the gospel, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, yes, the death, burial, and resurrection. Those of you that are saved, if you want to live free from sin, you have to follow after the spirit and not your flesh. If you are concerning and worrying about the ordinances of men, then you need to check your spirit. Because the spirit does not sin and there is no sin in the spirit. Read 1 John chapter 3, the whole entire chapter, and check yourself. You can check yourself with the word. People say, oh, you judge, you judge, you judge, you judge. No, the word is judging you. It is the word of God that is passing judgment. All I do is preach to teach the word. If anything that I say, and if you feel it's judging me, then so be it. See it the way you see it. But it's the word. Then that means you are convicted. So if you find yourself feeling some kind of way about this word, that means that's conviction rather than getting upset. Then say, Lord, what must I do? The jailer, the jailer that that uh, 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 housed Paul and Silas, when when Paul and Silas was loosed, the bands was loosed, and they got up, and they sought to kill themselves because they they when they saw the bands was loose, they didn't see Paul and Silas at first, so they got a, they got frightened, they got scared, and they sought to kill themselves because um they uh, uh um. They saw that they wasn't there. But guess what? Paul and Silas were still there. And he told them, well, don't do it. Don't do it. And because he showed them he's still there, that day he knew that there is a God. And that same guard officer turned around and asked him, what must we do to be saved? What must we do to be saved? And even through that, God gave me a, God gave me a message. And, and, and through that, that, that's one of them times. And, and, and Lord, Lord, in the future, I preach that message. Um, that's when I will take the scripture and take a message out of the scripture. You got that's the difference. But God showed me something, and, and I'm gonna give you just a little tidbit. Um, if the Lord's will, uh, the first Friday in February, the first Friday of February, I might be preaching that message. But you understand the scripture that the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, God loosed the bands. And when the guard went looking for him, he saw the kill him. So he said, don't do it. We're still here. But what Lord showed me in that, and he showed me, he said to us, those that are in situations, God has delivered you by Jesus Christ. He has loosed the bands. Why are you still here? Why are you still in the situations that you're in if God has loosed the band? If God has set you free, 
There was a song that we used to sing. My Lord set me free. Why should I be bound? So when he showed me that in the scripture, he should, from that, the message I got from that, he said, there are a lot of people, he said, that I have delivered. I have set free. And they are still here. Why did Paul and Silas stay there? Their bands were loose. He said, don't do it. Don't kill yourself. We're still here. And a lot of people are still in the situations when God has delivered them. So that's when you take a message out of the scripture, not necessarily preaching it wrong, but you can take a message out of scripture. That's why I say there's a difference between you preaching and how a preacher gets a, delivers the message versus a teacher. So there is a vast difference. So um, if the Lord say the same, we will be delivering that message because that's what I was praying as God what to preach on that day. And when I was reading, studying, studying for this, he gave me that message. And I, I saw that, so I thank God for that. Amen. So I pray that someone will hear and have heard something through this, these Bible classes so far, that will make them search out the word and make them, you know, get right with God. This is not a challenge to people, but it's only a challenge to get right with God. I got less than 60, 60 seconds left on my broadcast. And um, I asked, I'm actually videotaping this message as we go forward. So I will say to those that uh, will edit those that will hear the comments that you will hear from the caller that you want to actually hear on the videotape. And so um, we might edit, um, splice some of those times out because if I'm, they look at the videotape, they won't see me talking. I'm actually listening to the caller. And so, because we're trying to get the word out there, whether it be by video or audio, we're just trying to get the word out there. I'm not producing myself. That's why if you see the, the, some of the advertisers that I put out, I say I'm spotlighting the word of God. The spotlight is not on me, but the spotlight is on Jesus Christ. So again, I pray that this word go out and help change your life. I'm going to close with a prayer. The Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word. We ask you to bless the sanctified, Lord, that it be blessed the hearer of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed in Jesus' name. God bless you all. Amen. Good